Thank you very much, John. Can you hear me okay? I hear you loud and clear. All right. So thank you to everybody for being here today. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this conference. It's my first time, and I'm very impressed with the way that this is all organized. I was invited to participate on behalf of my book, Voices for Animal Liberation, Inspirational Accounts by Animal Rights Activists. And I will go ahead and show it to you. And I'm going to share my screen. Give me just a moment. All right, and let me open my presentation. All right, is that visible? Yep, we see it. Great. All right. So the title of my presentation is How Animal Exploitation Affects Everyone and Everything. And I'll be talking today about the interconnection between humans, non-human animals, and the planet, and how we are, we're all connected and we all need to uh, make things better uh, for, for all of us. So I just want to start out by sharing a few quotes to set the scene for the presentation. The first line on the screen uh, below the title actually comes from my book, a vegan world is imperative for the survival of the planet and all of its inhabitants. This is a line that I wrote myself. And to me, it really encapsulates what this presentation is about. And so I chose to include it um, in, my, in my introduction. I really, truly, deeply, and wholly feel that a vegan world is crucial for all survival. And the studies point to this, and we'll I'll go more into depth. Uh, but you know, we share this planet uh, with non-human animals. We are all Earthlings, and we need to, as humans, we need to start doing a better job, a much better job, of honoring and respecting the other species on the planet uh, to just try to achieve harmony and peace. I have a quote uh, by Martin Luther King Jr., famous quote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This is a powerful quote that has been used in many different capacities over the decades. And it uh, really highlights what I want to focus on today, that injustice to animals creates injustice to humans because of this interconnection. And so that uh, stands out to me as being very important for this presentation. Below that is a quote by Christopher Heiner, who is involved in environmental law. And it says, climate change, ocean dead zones, fisheries depletion, species extinction, deforestation, world hunger, food safety, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, the list goes on. There is one issue at the heart of all these global problems that is too often overlooked by private individuals and policymakers alike, our demand for and reliance on animal products. So I'm just going to go ahead and Click to my next slide. These are two more important quotes, just again, setting the scene for uh, how animal exploitation and human exploitation are intertwined and directly connected. Uh, the quote at the top, uh, I included in my book, and it's by Mark Beckoff, a PhD, American biologist. Animals have qualities we find important to the legal rights of humans, like self-awareness, the need for sovereignty, and the capacity for suffering, love, and empathy. We will never fully dismantle the injustices humans suffer 
without deconstructing the same problems that lead to animal suffering. And then the quote at the bottom by Jane Velez Mitchell of Unchained TV, formerly called Jane Unchained News. Uh, this quote is actually on the back of my book, on the book jacket, uh, as an endorsement for my book. Find out why respect for other living beings is the key to human survival in the face of senseless violence and climate change. This is just the image of the book and um, the subtitle, Inspirational Accounts by Animal Rights Activists. It is a collection of diverse voices from the animal rights movement. And I would actually like to share a little bit from the back of the book because this is, again, I was invited to participate in this conference because of my book, and it really does contain what I'm speaking about today uh, as my topic. So in today's world, voices of the marginalized are in the spotlight, and people across the globe are recognizing animal rights as a social justice movement. During a time of historic actions and victorious campaigns, Voices for Animal Liberation depicts the full spectrum of animal rights activism that is currently at work to create change. This book offers the words of both new and highly influential voices in the movement today, with the intention of inspiring and educating those who are sparked by the vision of a more ethical world. Connect with activists from different backgrounds as they reveal their perspectives on animal rights, their experiences taking action for animals, the challenges they've faced, and the meaning of activism in their lives. And the book is, it was released by Skyhorse Publishing in March 2020, and it's available through the publisher's website on Amazon, through Barnes & Noble, and there's an audio audiobook version uh, now available as well. And this is a an image from the book that is near the end of the book. And the reason I chose to include this is because visually it really portrays my vision for the world and my fellow animal rights activists and my, uh, you know, the, those of us that are very dedicated to uh, justice for all beings. And it's showing all different species, um, including a human walking together on a path towards liberation. And there's another human at the open door. And um, just the idea of everybody living in harmony and um, going towards the light, out of the darkness, out of the secrecy that the animal agriculture industry uh, enables and perpetuates, and um, all joining together in, in peace and harmony for a, a world that includes uh, liberation for all beings. So now I will tell you a bit about myself and my experience. I am the campaign specialist for captive animals at In Defense of Animals, an international animal advocacy organization with a 40 year history. I have only been working for IDA for a year and a half. And I started the position at the same time that I relocated from the Los Angeles area here to Tucson, Arizona. And I started my micro sanctuary, Desert Oasis Turtle and Tortoise Sanctuary, also known as DOTS. And my work for In Defense of Animals involves a lot. I lead campaigns and advocacy work for animals who are exploited for entertainment, um, such as the rodeo, horse racing, different forms of um, animal abuse involved in entertainment. I advocate for animals who are exploited in zoos, marine parks, circuses, the pet trade. Um, so again, I'm the campaign specialist for captive animals and I am proud to work for, for IDA. Um, I'm a writer as well, and this is my first and only book, uh, but I have written and had published many different articles. And I have up on the screen here, uh, Elephant Journal, because I have close to 20 articles published on this literary site, 
that are awareness raising articles on different animal issues that involve the environment and involve health. And so this has been a great outlet for my writing and um, their tagline, Elephant Journal's tagline is dedicated to the mindful life. And they publish on all kinds of topics. I mean, pretty much anything under the sun, but I do appreciate their tagline dedicated to the mindful life and my writing has found a home there. Unfortunately, I have not written and published any articles uh, anytime recently. It's been quite some time since I have uh, submitted something to um, Elephant Journal or to anywhere else for that matter um, because of being very, very busy and other obligations. I do a lot of writing for my work at In Defense of Animals. I produce content such as action alerts, media releases, blogs, um, I'm constantly involved in writing for my job, so it leaves little time for uh, time and energy for other writing and, you know, being on the computer so much. So uh, anyway, that's about me. And I was a teacher in the Los Angeles area, and I was a writing instructor, and I also was able to teach some classes based on social justice and activism. I taught in a private, progressive, small program. And so I really was able to loop in my activism to my teaching, which was wonderful. But um, like I said, when I relocated um, here to Tucson, Arizona, I, I started the position for IDA. So this is the way that the presentation will run. I'm going to talk about interconnection. And part one is focused on human health. Part two, the planet. Part three, is human injury, danger, and violence. Part four is a closing and moving forward. And thank you again to everybody for being here. So let's see, let me hide my, just a moment so I can see my whole screen. All right, so again, I'm focusing on the interconnectedness of humans, non-human animals, and the planet. And by the way, I will be referencing different articles that I have had published on Elephant Journal. So I'll be clicking on links and we'll be taking a look at some of my writing content that helps support the points that I'm making. So the first point, and I know it sounds basic and, and elementary, uh, we are all animals, and that is biologically and scientifically obvious. Uh, however, we human animals tend to forget that. Um, in society in general, we tend to uh, consider ourselves superior to other animal species, and we have a, a superiority complex, <laughs> is how I would put it. In order for us to really truly understand that animal exploitation, non -animal, non human animal exploitation, and human exploitation are, are connected and directly linked, we first and foremost need to recognize, but on a deeper level, that we are all animals. So there are non human animals and human animals. And it, it really bears repeating because of the fact that it is so often overlooked. And that is what creates this, these injustices that uh, the humans create for non-human animals. Um, because we're not uh, really uh, believing in the fact or fully accepting the fact that we are all animals and you know we're all earthlings and we share this planet. I love the image that I have here on this slide of the earth with different species and including humans together around the planet. Um, and th this is my vision for the world. And I know that um, most of you share the same image to live in peace and harmony with our fellow earthlings. So after recognizing and, and really accepting that we are all animals, we need to challenge the notion of separateness and we need to change the mentality of separation based on form. And I talk about that in, in my book. So this idea of the other, right? Of being, of being separate. We are humans and they're animals. They're just animals as if they're inferior. That needs to be dissolved. 
because again, we cannot um, really move forward uh, as a species. Humans cannot move forward in uh, creating planetary peace without without that. So um, we really need to hold other people accountable for challenging the notion of separateness. And one example is, um, you know, this us versus them idea, uh, or referring to animals as it. Uh, that That's like a, a little thing that, you know, that really bothers me. And I know, I know oftentimes it's accidental. Uh, people will say it, or if they don't know the sex of the animal, they will say it. It's better to say they, uh, because it is a actually demeaning, uh, it, it's an, it objectifies animals and it, and it really reduces them to objects. Um, and, uh, you know, people often don't realize that, but it does objectify them. So um, we just need to see ourselves as being on the same level as non-human animals, as our, our fellow earthlings, and recognize that we are not better than them. Yes, we drive cars, we hold jobs, we give presentations, we make money. None of that does anything to assign value. And we uh, need to do a much better job of really advocating for equality for all beings. And I know that many of you uh, know the term speciesism, the discrimination uh, based on species. And so we need to really work to dismantle speciesism and changing the mentality of separation based on form is that you know a dog is a pig is a rat is a human we you know we come into this life in different physical forms and we're all we all have a soul we all have a spirit and we all are equal you know i'm i'm no better than my dog i'm just different a different species. And so that is something that I really want to emphasize. Um, and then in order, you know, once we get that out of the way, then we can really honor and respect our interconnectedness. And that to me is what humanity really should be about, is recognizing and respecting and valuing and honoring everybody that shares the same planet. So now I am going to uh, click on this link, which is actually the introduction to my book that I wrote that uh, was published on Elephant Journal. So let me. All right. Are you able to see this? I just want to check. Yeah, we see it. Great. OK, so um, this is the title of my book. Um, at the top. And, and this is my whole introduction that was published in full here. Um, and there's me uh, at, a, at an action for, for anim uh, at the animals. And so, all right, I'm just going to read just uh, some little sections here. As an animal rights activist, it is common to hear remarks such as, what about human rights? Don't you care about humans? There are so many human problems in the world. Let's solve those first. There's a widespread view that our own issues should be solved before animal issues are addressed, as if we need to demonstrate loyalty to our own species before advocating on behalf of others. This promotes the ideology of human superiority and reinforces a disconnect between humans and non-humans. What we should be acknowledging is our interconnectedness, the fact that all beings, have the capacity for love, joy, pain, and fear. Animal rights and human rights are inextricably connected. For example, there are multiple human and environmental issues that stem from animal issues. If we want to create a peaceful world, we must pay close attention to the ways in which human and non-human issues are related and honor the interdependence between our species and others. So I'm just going to uh, skip down here. There are certain points I want to make illustrated through certain passages. In today's world, there's greater reason than ever to consider the plight of animals and the impact of animal agriculture on the planet. More and more environmentalists are advocating for a plant-based diet, 
Considering that animal agriculture is a leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions, ocean dead zones, water pollution, deforestation, and species extinction. The planet simply cannot sustain itself with the present mass industrialized system. Add this to the increasing number of health issues related to the consumption of animal products, and it becomes undoubtedly clear that it behooves humanity to work together to end animal farming. And then I'll skip down here. to this part. The liberation of non-human beings is vital to the whole of the planet's success and is necessary for peace on earth. The activists who are featured in this collection believe that being vegan is the least we can do and that engaging in activism is necessary. And I'm just skipping down. All right, so I'm gonna click out of this article. And then go to an excerpt from the book uh, that is from my own story. So my story is included along with my contributors' stories because it is an anthology. So this is an excerpt from my story. And the title of my piece in the book is living in alignment with my values, my path to animal rights activism. So I'm just going to read this uh, little section. Though animals are similar to us in the ways that truly matter, such as the capacity to experience pain, fear, joy, and emotional connection, they have been deemed inferior and thereby have no real rights as citizens of the earth. Albert Einstein said, our task must be to free ourselves by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. Our ability to achieve planetary peace depends on our ability to stop the mentality of separation based on form and instead honor our interconnectedness by embracing all beings. If we hope to evolve into a society of justice, it is crucial that we value everyone, including non-human animals, as deserving of rights and autonomy. So I'll move on to the next slide. Um, just a question for you, John. Is the size of the text on my articles big enough for the audience to see? Uh, John, are you there? All right, that's okay. <laughs> so part one is on human health. And I'm starting with health because the whole conference is called The Real Truth About Health. And so I thought I would just dive right into the health aspect of, of all of this. So when I'm talking about human health, there's personal health and public health and the ways in which animal exploitation affects our health. So my first point is to dismantle the notion that animal exploitation is separate from us and our lives. So to extrapolate a little bit more on this is that, uh, as I said earlier, animal exploitation and human exploitation are directly connected. They are, they're definitely interrelated. Um, and I said earlier that we are all animals and we are. So um, I, I do refer, I use the terms animals and humans. I don't always say non-human animals every time, but everybody understands that just, you know, we, we that's how we classify um, the terms human and animal. Um, but of course, we are all animals and that that is understood. So uh, when non-human animals are abused, we are in turn abused. And I think many people have a hard time wrapping their mind around this. Well, how, you know, how is that possible? You know, an, an animal is being abused 
in a, in a factory farm and animals being tortured or um, somebody's, somebody's dog is being abused um, or, uh, you know, their animals are being abused for entertainment in the circus. Like how does that affect us? You know, we're, we're not in their position. We're not in that factory farm. We're not in that circus, but it absolutely affects us on various levels. So, um, to first talk about, you know, physical health effects and the consumption of animal products. I know that this conference has focused a lot on this. I mean, that really is a, a huge focus is the consumption of animal products causing physical health effects. Um, and I'm going to reference a couple articles in a moment. Uh, hormones and antibiotics that are, uh, you know, given to animals that are on factory farms and then end up in the food that people are served, the hormones and antibiotics that are that animals are pumped full of in the um, animal agriculture industry and the you know factory farms and slaughterhouses, then of course cause effects on human health um, because humans are ingesting these substances. Uh, the next point is that, and this is really key for me, that animal exploitation affects more than our physical health. It affects our psychological health and well-being. Um, and there are, there are studies that, that illustrate this. Um, when, when animals are being tortured and abused, it, it really it causes you know, effects uh, for, for us in ways that reach beyond physical health. The next point is that um, not only personal health, but public health. Uh, in terms of environmental pollution, sanitation hazards, and so forth. The breeding of viruses that are just really a, a, a big problem in factory farms and slaughterhouses, and the effect that that has on public health. The workers themselves who are employed in those facilities and then, and then beyond, um, outside of those facilities and the ripple effect that, that this has. There are some documentaries that I recommend in regards to health, uh, what the health, forks over knives, eating you alive, the game changers, plant pure nation, and vegetated. So if you want to make a note of those, I'm sure many of you have seen many of these, but just wanted to give a list. And these are documentaries that are pertaining um, mainly to, to health. All right, so I'm going to click on this article. This article I had published uh, in 2020, and it's titled Four Urgent Reasons to Go Vegan Today Besides Saving Animals. I do want to point out that in my articles that were published, um, some statistics have changed or increased, you know, as, as time has passed. So um, I, I have hyperlinks in my articles that provide source information for the facts that I included the, and the information I included in my articles. But I um, just want to, you know, give a little disclaimer that, um, you know, I have articles that were published several years ago on Elephant Journal. And um, of course, statistics change and uh, the numbers increase and so forth. So, all right, this is a picture of me uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, 2020, just brand new pandemic. Everybody was masked. You know, you had to be in uh, California. I, I lived in the Los Angeles area at the time and it was mandatory. Um, so here I am in sprouts in the plant-based section and my mask says eating animals causes pandemics. And my little caption, this was on Instagram, was, who needs to see this message today? Everybody grocery shopping in Sprouts. Um, and so I'm just going to share uh, a few passages from this. All right, so personal health, number one. And um, is, the, is the text big enough for the audience to see? Just curious. I see. I see. Very, the text is very clear to me. Is it? It's large enough, John, or should yes. I? Okay. 
I didn't want it to be like tiny on, on your end. Okay. So personal health. And you know, a lot of you know a, a lot of this already. And um, but you know, there it never hurts to emphasize these these things. So consuming animal products is linked to a significant number of health issues, including heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and certain types of cancers. These health risks are now recognized by many doctors and prominent organizations, including the National Institute of Health and the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization has classified processed meats as a group one carcinogen, which puts them in the same category as cigarettes. Meat clogs arteries and causes blood vessel blockages, which can lead to heart disease, stroke, and erectile dysfunction. Dairy is acidic and causes inflammation. Research has found that milk from cows treated with the hormone RBGH contains up to 10 times more insulin growth factor. IGF has been associated with an increased risk of breast, prostate, colon, and lung cancers. The next paragraph talks about the hormones and antibiotics. Um, maybe I'll paraphrase a little bit uh, that the hormones and antibiotics have damaging effects on our health. Uh, approximately 70% of antibiotics sold in the United States go to animals to counteract the effects of poor sanitation and overcrowding and promote faster growth. I uh, guess I'll just go ahead and read it. <laughs> the use of antibiotics in animal farming poses a serious threat to humans because it creates new strains of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And you can see in red, those are my hyperlinks uh, to, to take people to um, the sources if they click on that. So, and then public health. So, you know, this first section on personal health, but the, this next section is on public health. And this is something that I really feel is not emphasized enough. So I just want to take a moment to, to dive into this a little. Personal health, when it comes to personal health, you know, everybody becomes concerned, right? About, about their grandmother. Um, their, you know, their, their grandmother um, has, you know, type 2 diabetes or their, their father has had heart attacks. Um, or, you know, they themselves have health issues. And so um, the idea of, of cutting out animal products to improve health, that on a personal level, that often makes sense to people. Um, there are still plenty of people, obviously, that will never drop animal products, or you know, at least they are convinced that, that they won't, regardless of health issues. There are the people who uh, will continue to eat bacon and sausage, and you know, they don't care if they've had to bypass heart surgeries, they're going to continue to live their lifestyle. Um, but transitioning to public health, we all have a responsibility. Society in general has a responsibility to improve public health. We can't control anybody else's diet. We cannot um, manage, you know, what people are eating and what, you know, what they're putting into their own bodies and how they are damaging their own personal health. But public health we have an obligation to do better. And our policymakers, our lawmakers, our government has an ab absolute obligation to do better. So public health. People living near factory farms are subjected to environmental pollution and sanitation hazards. Poor sanitation and waste management lead to contamination of the food supply with bacteria like E. coli and salmonella. Concentrated animal feeding operations, known as CAFOs, are massive cesspools where industrial farms dispose of billions of gallons of urine and feces every year. This produces dangerous gases, noxious smells, and dust containing bacteria. Harmful compounds like hydrogen sulfide and ammonia are released into the air, and people living near these waste pools have an increased risk of respiratory problems sore throats, diarrhea, eye irritation, depression, and other conditions. Animal waste contaminates drinking water as nitrates seep from lagoons and spray fields into groundwater. Manure can contain traces of heavy metals and our water quality is compromised by phosphorus and nitrogen, two elements that are present in animal waste. Um, so, and I want to point out too that it's often uh, people of 
low income that are living near factory farm and uh, you know the sprawling factory farm facilities and slaughterhouses, you know, and it's really, this is a human rights issue. Animal rights are human rights. We're all connected. As I said, I'm going to reemphasize the idea of interconnection. Um, but we we really do need to absolutely get rid of these facilities, get rid of these facilities because, um, <laughs> sorry, there was just a sound outside my window. And so my dog is barking. Just one moment. <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. I share my home with non-human non-human animals, and there is some noise outside, and my dog was just reacting. So, um, anyways, as I was saying, um, yeah, we just we have an obligation to um, really change things, to get rid of factory farms, to get rid of slaughterhouses, and to end animal agriculture, like to end the industry in general, because it just causes so many issues, so many interrelated problems in, in our world that affect all of us. They affect the planet and they affect all of us, humans and non-human animals alike. So I'm just going to scroll down to the section on pandemics, number four, and I'm going to just read this part right here. So viruses and disease start in live animal markets and wet markets and the use of animals for human consumption was the origin of viruses such as swine flu sars and bird flu among others michael greger who i know is a speaker in this conference uh, author of bird flu a virus of our own hatching states when we overcrowd animals by the thousands in cramped football field sized sheds to lie beak to beak or snout to snout, and there's stress crippling their immune systems, and there's ammonia from the decomposing waste burning their lungs, and there's lack of fresh air and sunlight, put all these factors together and you have a perfect storm environment for the emergence and spread of disease. All right, I'm going to click out of here. and click on the next article, which is called What Choosing a Plant-Based Diet Has to Do with Human Rights. Again, emphasizing the interconnection between all of us and everyone and everything. And this article I had published in 2018. It's uh, five years old. And so again, there are statistics and numbers and things that have changed um, since then. So I'm going to go down to, and actually there's some crossover in my articles. There are sections that are very similar or they're just, I've utilized them for different articles that I've, um, that I've written and had published. So I won't, I won't repeat um, as best I can, but um, this just number one, as I mentioned from the previous article, people living near factory farms are subjected to environmental pollution, sanitation hazards, and associated health risks. Okay, I don't need to read the detail there. And um, as we know, hormones and antibiotics used in animal agriculture have damaging effects on human health. And I also do not need to read that info because I, uh, it's a crossover from the last article. But I at least wanted to show it to you. If any of you have an interest in reading these articles in full, you can just go to elephantjournal.com and put in my name and you can find I have um, close to 20 articles uh, published on this site. So I'll click out of here. All right, moving on to part two, the planet. And this quote at the top by Peter Singer, author of Animal Liberation, that was published in 1975, and he was considered the father of the animal rights movement. This quote is really thought provoking. It says, we are quite literally, let's see, I have my 
sorry about that. I had a pop up on my screen. We are quite literally gambling with the future of our planet for the sake of hamburgers. Let's take a moment and let that sink in. Even people who are diehard meat lovers, they're, they eat their hamburgers and they don't think two bits about it. Um, regardless of the animals, their own health. Think about the fact that the production of hamburgers, you know, in from factory farms to slaughterhouses is really affecting our planet in a significant way. And so to me, this just, it's really powerful. We are quite literally gambling with the future of our planet for the sake of hamburgers. I mean, I think if you asked any anybody, they would say that this is not okay. Like, I don't know anybody who would actually be like, yeah, hamburgers are, are worth it. You know, our hamburgers are more important than our planet. That's basically what this idea is, is that, you know, society is actually putting uh, food, and I use food in quotes because really they are um, dead animals, but uh, people are prioritizing their hamburgers and their hot dogs over, over the planet, over the health and future of our planet. We are in a planetary crisis. Um, and so I, I really encourage people to share that quote because I think it's really pivotal. So the first point on here, animal agriculture, as I mentioned in the introduction, is a leading cause of greenhouse gas emissions, ocean dead zones, water pollution, deforestation, water waste, species, ex species extinction, the list goes on. Um, of course, we know that greenhouse gas emissions that are produced by um, methane is driving climate change. Um, the studies have uh, clearly shown this. And uh, we, we know that uh, climate change is being driven by, you know, various industries, but today I'm focusing on animal agriculture. Uh, our oceans, the next point is oceans, and our oceans are facing crisis uh, on multiple levels and, and because of different factors. So our oceans are really in danger. Documentaries that I recommend in regards to the planet and uh, based on uh, animal agriculture's detrimental effects to the environment are Cowspiracy, Seaspiracy, Eating Our Way to Extinction, Eating Animals, The End of Meat, and then a, a little short one called Meat Hooked and End of Water. So if you want to take a moment and make a note of those, um, and I highly recommend these be shared with people who are not convinced about the devastating effects of the animal agriculture industry on our planet. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, open an article here. And this is an article that I brought up earlier, but now we're focusing on the planet. So again, for urgent reasons to go vegan today, and I'm going to scroll down to past uh, the health stuff to number three, the planet. Animal farming is highly destructive to the environment. Many environmentalists advocate for a plant-based diet. Uh, actually, I, I read that part in the beginning because that's also in my introduction. But let me just jump to... Right here, over 37% of methane emissions result from factory farming. Methane has a global warming potential 20 times higher than carbon dioxide. Industrial agriculture uses 70% of the world's fresh water supplies. And water polluted with agricultural runoff can damage ecosystems, resulting in toxic effects on wildlife. Manure that runs off the land accumulates in waterways and ruptured waste lagoons have caused massive fish kills. Um, this article was published, let me just get the date. Uh, oh, this was in um, 2020. So again, these numbers, you know, may have shifted and, and increased um, or, you know, just to point out again, that um, things, things have, uh, shifted. Uh, all right. So going back down to this part on the planet, uh, this is very important to make people aware of. 
uh, the amount of land, the acreage that is cleared for crop fields, most of which are used to grow livestock feed. So this part says tremendous amounts of land, water, and energy are required to harvest and transport feed for farmed animals. According to the United Nations, over 260 million acres of forest have been cleared to make room for crop fields in the United States. And that's just in the United States, most of which are used to grow livestock feed. Additional resources are used to raise animals, dispose of their waste, transport them to slaughter, and process their bodies. All right. So go down to this article now. Again, this one from 2018. And I'll scroll down to the environment um, section. Number six, animal agriculture creates serious detrimental effects on the environment. So some of this, it, it's crossover and it. And so I will um, try to avoid repeating, but um, let's see. Uh, if there's anything in here worth pointing out that was not already, oh, that section actually was just shared in the other article, but this part is a very important component to this, to this entire picture. Number seven, animal agriculture expends valuable resources that could be conserved to reverse world hunger. Enough grain is currently produced globally to feed two times as many people as there are on earth. 77% of coarse grains and over 90% of soy grown in the world is fed to livestock. Another source claims that we produce enough calories to feed 10 to 11 billion people worldwide. With the majority of grains used to feed livestock, we are making extremely inefficient use of all of this food. Furthermore, by the year 2050, the Earth's population is expected to rise to 9.7 billion people which will create even greater strain on the world's food production resources. A shift from the consumption of animal-based foods to plant-based foods would enable the production of more grains on existing cropland, which would feed more people instead of livestock while using significantly less of our natural resources. Um, I also want to say that I do not like to refer to animals as livestock. That is a demeaning, an objectifying term, but I'm using it because it's what the industry uses. And I'm just trying to, um, you know, differentiate that, um, you know, what basically what the animals are being used for. And that um, in, in the world, the majority of grains are used for the types of animals who, who are known as livestock. But yeah, I really can't stand the term um, livestock just personally. Uh, I'm just trying to be accurate, though. So um, let's see. And I, you know, the numbers are probably greater now. I mean, this was uh, from 2018. This article. So um, these these numbers, I sh I'm sure, have um, probably increased. And, you know, at, at that time in 2018, it was 77 percent of coarse grains and over 90 percent of soy grown in the world um, is to feed the animals, animals who are known as livestock. Um, but could be, could be more now. I, um, all right, I'm gonna click out of here. And go back to, all right. So moving on to the next portion, part three, human injury, Danger and violence. Leo Tolstoy said, as long as there are slaughterhouses, there will always be battlefields. It's a very powerful quote that really makes people think. And it's, it's really true. As long as animals are being tortured and killed, human, humans will too. I mean, again, it's, we're all connected. The next quote by Pythagoras, for as long as men massacre animals, they will kill each other. Indeed, he who sows the seeds of murder and pain cannot reap joy or love. That's uh, supposed to say uh, reap joy or love. 
And the next quote by Thomas Edison, nonviolence leads to the highest ethics, which is the goal of all evolution. Until we stop harming all other living beings, we are still savages. So just quotes that really support my whole point in um, really trying to uh, address the ways in which we're all connected. So um, the first point here is the link between animal abuse and violence towards humans. Phil Arkow, coordinator of the National Link Coalition, and probably many of you have heard of this, the NLC, the National Link Coalition, which is a group focusing on the intersection between violence toward humans, toward animals and humans. So um, this coalition has really done some fantastic work in uh, holding studies and doing a lot of research on what is referred to as the link. And again, it's the intersection between violence towards animals and humans and how they are directly connected. Uh, moving on to the next point is that slaughterhouses and factory farms are dangerous for workers and cause injuries. So this section is on a human injury and danger that you know workers are faced with in these facilities, factory farms and slaughterhouses, and then also violence that um, humans cause to each other that often stems from violence towards, towards um, non-human animals. So uh, the next point is that workers are overworked, underpaid, and subjected to unfair working conditions. And the next one, workers suffer not only negative physical issues, but psychological issues. So working in these facilities affects their physical and mental health. And therefore, in turn, it, it's like the domino effect or, or the ripple effect that the workers who are in these facilities who are overworked and underpaid and, um, you know, subjected to injuries, then they become, it affects their mental health and they become depressed and angry. Also, you know, I have to mention the types of, of horrors that they're, that they're faced with working in those facilities. Um, it, it takes a toll on mental health. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. Um, you know, over time, these workers, they, uh, studies have shown they become more withdrawn. Um, they struggle with depression anger issues. And then in turn, that ripples out to their families, their, their friends, the people that they're connected with, um, their own animals at, at home, you know, their dogs, their cats. So it, it can, um, and this is not to say at all. So please, please don't get me wrong. This is not to say that people who work in slaughterhouses or factory farms end up ab abusing, you know, other animals in the home or or their um, family, not at all. But it's it's to say though that um, this kind of work environment affects not only their physical but their mental health, and and it can create issues in their personal lives that um, studies have shown. You know, like I said, with depression and, and anger. So the bottom line is that animal rights issues are human rights issues, and that that really is the key focus. So I will um, move to the next slide. All right, and I'm just going to reference, you know, back to this article that we've seen a few times already, but I have different sections that relate to different uh, points. So um, scrolling down from past the um, health stuff is number three. Increased crime rates exist in areas where slaughterhouses are located. In his 1906 novel, The Jungle, Upton Sinclair illustrated the devastating work conditions and living environments in Chicago's stockyard slaughterhouses during the turn of the 20th century. He made a connection between the killing and butchering of animals and the after-work fights initiated by slaughterhouse workers. Decades later, criminology professor Amy Fitzgerald has completed various studies that show a definitive link between slaughterhouse environments and crime. According to her investigations, crime rates increase when the number of slaughterhouse workers in a community increases. 
One such study indicated that slaughterhouse employment, in comparison with other industries, correlates with increased arrests for violent crimes, such as rape and other offenses. So I know that a couple minutes ago I said that I don't want to, um, you know, put it out there and make it sound like the workers in slaughterhouses and factory farms are then in turn, uh, you know, abusing other animals and and um, their families and and you know humans. But as you can see, this is often the case. Um, but I just didn't want to generalize and and make it seem like well. If they're working in slaughterhouses and factory farms, then it's only a matter of time that they're going to commit violence to humans or other animals. That's not what I'm saying. But as we can see, there are um, there's there is a link, and studies have shown that um, in in many cases, but not all, of course. Um, all right. So number four, animal abusers often demonstrate violence and abuse toward humans. So now I'm no longer talking about workers in factory farm and slaughterhouse facilities. Now we're talking about more generally with just humans in general out in the world who abuse animals often then demonstrate violence and abuse towards humans. Um, numerous studies have revealed that child abuse and domestic abuse are often linked to a history of animal cruelty. Several academic studies have found that a significant number of people who commit acts of violence against humans in their adulthood previously committed acts of animal cruelty during their youth. Due to this correlation, animal cruelty reports are routinely used in legal assessments of criminals and the threats they pose. Studies have found that men who abuse their family pets often abuse their spouses and or children as well. Okay, and these are linked. You can see the red hyperlinks. So they, they, link to sources, to the studies. Serial killers usually begin their sadistic behavior by inflicting cruelty on animals. And this has been shown time and time again. Jeffrey Dahmer, Ted Bundy, and Dennis Rader are three of the most prolific serial killers known to have tortured and killed animals in their youth. All right, number five, Slaughterhouse and factory farm workers are subjected to injurious working conditions. So I know I'm bouncing around, but um, this section on um, danger, injury, and violence um, covers all of this. So slaughterhouse and factory farm employees are overworked and underpaid. They kill and process mass numbers of animals at high speeds, doing thousands of repetitious movements with few breaks. The extreme pace of the work causes a set of chronic physical ailments, including injuries to workers' muscles, tendons, and nerves. The majority of employees in this industry are immigrants and refugees. Undocumented workers are faced with the threat of deportation, and supervisors use intimidation tactics to express that replacements are always available. As a result, and this is really important, as a result, workers are conditioned to accept a hazardous and demeaning work environment if they want to remain employed. And so I want us to think about empathy. I know it's hard to have empathy for people who work on factory farms and in slaughterhouses because they are killing animals. I mean, that's, that's their job. They're killing and quote processing animals. Um, but if we could, look at it, um, you know, try to look at it as best we can, is that this often is the only kind of work that these people can find. I mean, do we honestly think anybody would choose to work in a slaughterhouse if various options were available? So, um, you know, like, like it says here in my article, the majority of employees in this industry are immigrants and refugees. And um, oftentimes it's, you know, some of the only work they can find. And so this, again, is a human rights issue. And I, I just want to emphasize that, that, again, animal rights are human rights and it, it, the connections between all of us. And we, we really need to um, end the, you know, we need to shut down these facilities um, because not only does it exploit animals, this industry exploits animals, but the industry Animal agriculture industry also exploits humans. All right, so I will click out of here.
The next article is not one of mine. It is an article from Animal Legal Defense Fund, which is one of my favorite organizations, the ALDF, established in 1979. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know about ALDF, but they, um, they're they dedicated to animal law and they represent animals and uh, non-human animals in court cases and um, when it comes to uh, legal matters. Um, and so they do phenomenal work. And this is an article on the link between cruelty to animals and violence toward humans. So I'm just sort of supporting my points here with uh, drawing in some other articles besides my own. So this says people who hurt animals don't stop with animals. There's established an established link between cruelty to animals and violence towards humans. This is regularly referred to as the link. Uh, and I, I do think that, um, I mean, there, this is not always the case. So the opening line says people who hurt animals don't stop with animals. It should really say people who hurt animals often don't stop with animals. Um, this link makes it critically important that cruelty toward animals be taken seriously by law enforcement and by society at large. This is for the sake of the animals themselves and for people who are also at risk. Research shows the link between cruelty to animals and toward humans. So this just, um, it says ample research backs up the finding that there's a direct link between acts of cruelty to animals and violence toward humans. This includes child abuse, domestic violence, elder abuse, and other violent behavior. And then it gives some examples of research that supports that conclusion. Oh, I want to read this, though, because and this was from a study 10 years ago. So think about how much may have changed since then. It says another study published in 2013 found that 43% of those who commit school massacres also committed acts of cruelty to animals. So, and again, this was 10 years ago. Now with the rampant, you know, school, school shootings, I don't know what, what the percentage is. Um, Bill Arkow, again, uh, coordinator of the National Link Coalition, a group focusing on the intersection between violence towards animals and humans, has written often about animal abuse being an indication of domestic violence or what's called a predictor crime. All right, so I'm going to, um, a 2017 study, so this was six years ago, showed that 89% of women, that's a huge percentage, 89% of women who had companion animals during an abusive relationship, reported that their animals were also threatened, harmed, or killed by their abusive partner. All right, so the point is, is the law must protect animals and punish animal abusers. Our laws need to be strengthened, and that's something that the ALDF and other groups are working on. So we need uh, policymakers, we need the government to take the issue of animal abuse seriously, because of course, for the animals themselves who deserve justice and do not do not deserve to be, you know, tortured or, and harmed, but also uh, because of, of this reason, because of this correlation between abuse to animals and abuse to humans. So it's really important that it that it be taken more seriously in our society in general. So I will go on to the next article, which comes from the NLC, the National Link Coalition. I'm not really going to read much here, but I just wanted to show it to you. The National Link Coalition, working together to stop violence against people and animals. And let me zoom in here. Um, it's just, it starts out by saying that animal abuse, cruelty, and neglect are often considered isolated incidents, wholly separated from other forms of family violence. But then the, the work of this organization is to make that correlation, draw those connections, and provide research and source information to back it up. Um, and various studies have been done. So um, you can see here how they are linked. We've got um, animal abuse linked with child maltreatment, elder abuse, domestic violence. It talks about um, what are the effects of animal abuse. Um, 
And, uh, and then why should social services professionals pay attention to animal abuse? So if children are demonstrating abuse, um, anger towards animals, cruelty to animals, our social service professionals have an obligation to take that seriously, to not just brush it off as, you know, boys will be boys, or they're just, um, you know, they're just playing around or they're um, they're just testing the waters. Some of those excuses that that adults have actually made for children who are demonstrating signs of uh, you know, animal abuse behavior. Offenders often do not see animal cruelty as a serious crime um, and they may readily admit to animal abuse, but not to family violence. So again, it's this idea um, Speciesism, discrimination based on species, we need to stop this mentality of separation based on form and just recognize that we are all valuable. We're all equal, um, regardless of species. And we, we, you know, we all deserve um, to live peacefully and to not be harmed. So the next article is... Um, something from Michigan State University, they have uh, in their College of Law, it's their uh, legal and historical, their animal center. And I'm just gonna show this to you because this article does an excellent job of referencing a bunch of different sources on this topic. So, um, and I really like that it starts out by honoring that non-human animals experience pain, distress, and that they they feel they're capable of the same feelings that, that we are. So um, cruelty to animals and violence towards people have something in common. Both types of victims are living beings, feel pain, experience distress, and may die for their, from their injuries. And then it talks about how until recently, these were always seen as separate, animal abuse and human abuse. But now over time, more and more connections have been drawn to where it is undeniable. It really is the evidence and the research and the studies. It is undeniable, um, this link. Um, the next section, animal abuse is a predictor of future behavior. And there are there's a whole section on serial killers, um, which is quite interesting. It gives details about, um, you know, this like well-known serial killers and the different types of animal abuse that they committed um, often prior to their um, to their human killings. You know, they started out torturing animals and then moved on to humans. All right. So I just have a few more articles. Thank you so much for um, hanging in here and bearing with me. <laughs> the next one is, uh, this is an excellent resource for those of you who um, are interested in diving into this topic more, this is by FFAC, Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. They do excellent work. And the title of this article published um, just two years ago, Dangerous Working Conditions on Factory Farms. And this, now I'm kind of jumping from the violence back to injury and danger. I'm just going to paraphrase a little bit, but uh, that year, in 2021, you may have heard about this because it made national headlines. Six people were killed, and I believe there were 11 others that were injured from a liquid nitrogen leak at a chicken plant in Georgia. The tragic incident made national headlines, momentarily shedding light on the dangerous working conditions on factory farms and meatpacking plants in the country. And then it just talks about how these industries routinely subject vulnerable workers to dangerous, stressful, and exploitative working conditions. And it goes into detail about this incident in Georgia. And then it talks about vulnerable workers on factory farms and gives various statistics. And this is, you know, only two years old, this article. So um, and then it talks about um, toxic air and dangerous pollutants. That's another thing. It's not just the injuries that workers face. It's not just the danger to their physical health and their and their psychological, you know, mental health. But it's also that they're exposed to this toxic air and dangerous pollutants. Workers regularly inhale dangerous air pollutants that can lead to or worsen respiratory illness. Um, they're subjected to ammonia. Um, hydrogen sulfide and various um, 
inhalable particulate matter, particulate matter. Um, they have a high risk of amputations and injuries. Um, so just more information on all of that. And let's see, and a severe toll on mental health. And that is really important to, um, to be aware of and to acknowledge. So this is a really um, important article here. And let's see what else I've got. NPR. This is actually a fascinating, it's a, an interview with a slaughterhouse worker, um, a 31-year-old who uh, no longer but worked in a pork processing plant in Nebraska for five years until her injuries to her shoulder forced her to quit. So um, this, she's an immigrant from Mexico who had worked at a pork processing plant from 2011 to 2016. And um, I mean, it just gives her account of what she dealt with. And it's really, um, really awful. So let's see. Uh, just to highlight that workers are often um, subjected to, they often develop chronic physical ailments um, called muscul uh, musculoskeletal disorders or MSDs an array of injuries to their muscles, tendons, ligaments, and nerves that cause sprains, strains, or inflammation. So just try to wrap your head around this for a moment. Um, this, this woman, Teresa, Teresa stuffed seven to 10 pound hams in bags, at times up to 50 hams a minute. Like that doesn't even seem possible. Um, starting with a wage of 1150 an hour, um, and this, this interview was from 2016. I don't know what the wage would be now, but the point is, is that these people are underpaid and overworked um, big time. So uh, starting with a wage of 11.50 an hour, she worked 12 hour shifts, sometimes seven days a week. And um, then she started experiencing problems in her shoulder. After reporting the pain to her supervisors, they told her that if she was injured, she should go home. The supervisors were very nasty, she says. They wanted everything fast. They wanted to produce a lot of quantity. They didn't care about the people. These are her own words. Um, so she ended up going to the doctor um, who told her the shoulder problem was a bone spur and she just continued to have issues um, as many as many of the workers do. So let me scroll down here. Uh, workers in meat processing plants describe punishing rates of production punishing rates of production, leaving them with a lifetime of pain and physical problems. Um, and they, they can often, they've said that they can get fired if their injuries prevent them from working harder. Um, companies report a constant employee turnover. So if they're you know complaining about their injuries, they a lot of times the companies will just like replace them. Um, and again, this article is from 2016. So, um, you know, seven years later, I, you know, I don't know exactly what's changed um, to, to today, but um, the point is, is they, they are still underpaid and overworked. And this kind of work really shouldn't exist because animals should not be killed for food. Um, it just all needs to end. Again, animal exploitation uh, causes human exploitation. All right. And I think I just have two more articles and then I'll be kind of wrapping things up. So this one, oh, I guess three, this one is um, a site on labor.org and published uh, just last year in 2022. For slaughterhouse workers, physical injuries are only the beginning. And I'm not going to even read anything from here because I've already made my points, but I'm just kind of showing you supporting material on this topic in case anybody still needs to be convinced. Um, that this industry is so harmful to everybody. All right, so I'm just gonna scroll down and show you all of this information. I mean, this is how significant the effects are. Look at all of the information, all of the statistics and numbers and studies and sources and research just goes to show that this is a huge issue that really needs to be taken more seriously. And two more to just glance at. Again, back to the Animal Legal Defense Fund, industrial animal agriculture, exploiting workers and animals. Um, 
This opening, I think, is really important. The animal agriculture industry, which is primarily comprised of enormous multinational corporations, profits from exploiting animals and humans alike. And that, that's just the point. Um, exploited humans include industry workers who labor on factory farms and in slaughterhouses and meatpacking plants. These workers earn poverty wages to perform dangerous and traumatic jobs. Okay, and then it just breaks things down with some references at the bottom. And the last article that I'm going to pull up is from One Green Planet. And I really think this title is impactful. Uh, it was a very good title choice. The Human Victims of Factory Farming. Animals, non-human animals are not the only victims of, of factory farming. Um, so there's these pop-ups on the screen here. But um, let me just zoom in and... Yep. So again, just making making these same points and uh, what it's like working on a factory farm. Um, it has one of the largest turnover rates in America and for good reason. And so there's that article. So I'm going to click to my final slide and then I will be uh, taking questions Closing and moving forward. So I know I just gave a bunch of staggering statistics, um, catastrophic information and dire statistics, but it just goes to show that our planet, our own health, and of course, the non-human animals that we share the planet with are all, all of us are facing dire consequences. Uh, we, this is a planetary crisis and it needs to be first and foremost at the front of everything. Um, it needs to be uh, at the forefront of society. Um, it, the focus on what we need to do to uh, improve our planet, improve our own health, and make the world a better place for non-human animals needs to uh, be prioritized over capitalism, the corporations, um, you know, the elite. It's just we we have to make significant change and, and very soon. So I do believe that, um, as they say, the tide is turning and shift is happening. There is much more awareness about the environmental effects, um, the damaging effects on the environment from animal agriculture industry. And there is much greater awareness also about the detrimental effects on human health, both personal health and public health caused by this um, devastating industry of animal agriculture. So um, I don't wanna sound too, uh, sound doomsday, but it's, it is, all of this needs to be taken very seriously. I do see that, you know, shifts are happening. It's just, of course, they're not happening as fast and as soon as we would like and they're not happening as fast as we really need for them to happen. But, um, you know, things are, we're, we are reaching the tipping point. Um, and really the planet is dependent on this. We can't sustain um, life on earth at the rate we're going. <music>